There is a God that loves me. Pastor, he died for me. See, when the enemy, I'm so thankful for the word of God that I can get into his word. When the enemy says, you're left, you're forsaken, I can get in the word and say, there's nothing that can separate me from the love of Christ. No, my God died for me. His word says, but God committed his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. I've been purchased by his blood. I've been bought with the price of my life. I have hope. There's value in my life. There is value. Yes, 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 yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, God. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Why don't we give our hand clap unto the Lord? We have hands for tithing and offering, and we have Givelify. PayPal is available at Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madras, Missouri. Um, you can text to give at 833-883-9311. We're getting there. We're getting there. Amen. With the help of the Lord and the strength of the Holy Ghost. Is anybody thankful for the power of the Holy Ghost? I'm telling you, the power of the Holy Ghost can still change the life. It says, I can do all things in Christ. Amen. We can get our prayer on the board tonight. Say this with me. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Press down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs, better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed for me, and I am blessed for now. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus Christ. Lord, I plead your blood over each and every youth and young person up here. God, you have a purpose for their life. Lord, that is true. I can pray that. Lord, you have you died for us so that we can know your will. You died for us so that we can have a relationship with you. Lord, you, you want to use them. You want to, God. And I pray that the weapon formed against their life will not prosper. That is your word. And we're going to believe in it. We're going to declare it. We're going to declare it against the enemy, distractions, deceitfulness, God. We're going to plead the blood over them tonight. Lord, we lift you up. We glorify you for what you're doing in their life. Lord, I just pray that you continually get the glory in their lives, Lord. I pray that you anoint the teachers. I pray that they can minister with a pure heart, Lord, and that you give them the words to say and the thoughts to thank God. Lord, and I just praise you for what we feel. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, all right, if you want to lead them on back, we're going to turn it over to Pastor tonight. I know he's got a word from the Lord. I'm just thankful that I have an opportunity to learn, to change, and to just be more like him. God in the sanctuary. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We praise Him because He's listening. Right. My enemy's listening. My world is listening, and I'm listening. For my praise. Thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>
we're still in the we're still in the formation section of our series. This is the twelfth uh, handout. A couple of weeks I went two weeks on one handout, but uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm very nervous tonight because not calling it's gonna be ugly or nothing like that. Don't be worried all about that stuff. <laughs> that. 
because Jesus said it. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and Acts 1. What did he tell the disciples to do? Go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have to position ourselves to have as big a ministry as God wants us to have. Then, reviewing still, my light will shine. Then, my health will spring forth quickly. Then, righteousness will go before me, and the glory of the Lord will be my rear guard. Then we will be known as the restorer of the breach, the repairer of homes, the fixer of the broken. We learn that the goal of God is that we are our brother's teeth. And we are aware of our brother, our sister, whatever case there may be in. Find somebody every day. Ask the Lord to lay one of the brothers and sisters on your heart and pray for them. Every day. Can y'all do that? Yeah. New homework assignment. Just sometime through the day. And I'm telling you, when it becomes a habit, it'll just happen. Amen? Y'all with me tonight? Amen. With me? Because I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> the spiritual discipline of abstaining from one's own pleasures, denying one's own self, something that we want to do for the gifting of others, radically transforms us into the image of the one who calls us. Let's get delivered from it being all about me. Now, this stuff tonight's kind of thick. I don't have, I'm going to new stuff now. That was a quick review. I am not qualified. I don't have the intelligence. And more than anything, I don't have this, what I'm about to teach you. I don't have it whooped yet. But I'm telling you, it's heavy, it's thick. You're going to have to take it and do some work on your own with it. But tonight we're going to talk about in this growth process, emotional holiness. <laughs> emotional holiness. For many years, educational institutions of every kind, especially elementary and younger, they graded one's ability for problem solving by something called intelligent quotient, or IQ. There was, in effect, an entrance in the 1990s of a new way of categorizing folks or predetermining their ability to lead. So you could take, give someone a, or, or observe someone in the way they operated, and, and you, they did studies, extensive studies, to find out what qualities a person had to be a leader, and companies wanted this to happen. Uh, it was called, and I've spoken to you this about this before, but this new way of grading or categorizing people is called emotional intelligence. Anybody familiar with that term? Emotional intelligence. If you're not, you really need to be. And uh, emotional intelligence According to Daniel Goldman, who is by many considered the authority on emotional intelligence, is comprised of five skills. Now, this is not in the Bible, but it might should be. It is in other ways, what I'm about to tell you. And I don't have time to unpack it, but I'm telling you, it will get down where you live. Five skills that enable the best leaders to maximize their own performance and the performance of their followers. Now we know that God doesn't love us because of our performance, but we also know that we show we love him by our performance. Right? Remember that? Okay. I obey him, and that lets him know I love him. Y'all seeing that in the bread? Huh? It's all through the Old Testament about obeying the Lord. These five things... They're listed on there, but I'm going to just unpack them just a little bit before we move into emotional holiness. These five things, these five skills are first, self-awareness. And that is to know your own strengths, know your own weaknesses, know your own motivations, your own values, and the impact you can have on others. The second thing is self-regulation. And I want to get right here, and I'm going to stay here for a long time, but I'm not going to, because it ain't the Holy Ghost, it's me. Look what 
what self-regulation is. Controlling or redirecting disruptive impulses and moods. Emotional intelligence means recognize that when you show up salty, the effect it has on everybody. And learn to either subdue it or redirect it. Here's what I do in that case. Keep on sitting in my truck till me and the Lord have got whatever's going on up here worked out. It works for me. When I know I'm about to get out of that truck and I'm about to walk in the house and I'm going to show my behind if I get half a chance. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So I just sit there, Brother Jerry, and I work it out between me and the Lord because I, I read this. And I understand that everybody, oh, fellas, listen to me. I understand. I don't want to stay here long because I got a lot of stuff to, stuff to cover. But you know, mamas and daddies, that the whole household can be going good and you can show up mad and ruin everything. Daddy can do it and so can mama. You can do it at church. You can do it on the job. You have to be aware, and we already are aware of it, but for some reason or the other, if we look like we're Pentecostal, we can act like the devil. No, you can't. You can't. Self-regulation. Everybody say self-regulation. Self emotional intelligence. That's what that is. It's an emotional intelligence. It's not book learning. It's knowing people and understanding yourself and others. Motivation, that's the third one. Self-awareness, self-regulation, and motivation. Here's what motivation is. Is you can do it because of what it is, not because of what you get out of it. Come on. All right? You relish the achievement for its own sake rather than for accolades or rewards. And in the kingdom of God, that is you are honored or moved or motivated to serve because of the service, not because of what you get out of it. But it's the act. That's enough. Oh, I want to preach. It's enough, fellas, to be able to get to do it. It's enough to get to be able to be used by God. It's enough to be able to be led by the Spirit without somebody having to give you an attaboy. Right. Motivation. The fourth thing, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, and empathy. Fourth one, which is understanding other people's emotional makeup. Let me tell you how you do that. Pay attention. That's it. Pay attention. Pay attention. You cannot do this all wrapped up in you. Come on. And I'm telling you right now, the world is teaching us, the world is teaching us to stay wrapped up in you. They promote it, even sometimes in the case of going to church. Go to a church that makes you happy. Where in the world did that come from? Go to a church the Lord tells you to go to. Not that your preferences tell you to go to. Okay. Self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy. And the fifth one is social skills. Here's the problem. If you are a control freak, you can't do this. Because if you can't browbeat people, manipulate people, guilt people, or whatever you use to get people to do what you want, you can't do this. Social skill is build a connection with people so that together we can move in a desired direction. Don't try to force them. Don't try to push them. Y'all know we do that. Do it to your kids. We do it to Lottie today. Eat a good lunch, and you can have a cookie. Now, I, we've done something wrong. I did it wrong with my kids, too. 
I can't put a finger on it. I can't tell you about it. But this social skill, building a connection with people so you can go to the same place, that's how I came up. If my daddy would eat it, I would eat it. If my daddy did it, I would do it. If my grandpa did it, I would do it. If my grandpa ate it, I would do it. Whatever did he. Whatever my heroes did, I wanted to do it. Which included living for God. Building connections. You understand that? Rather than forcing people, or I'm the boss, you've got to do what I say. That doesn't work. Because as soon as you're not watching, they sit back down. But if you've built a connection and you know you're going somewhere together, Everybody feeling me all right? Okay. Here's the kicker. It appears that everyone, everybody say everyone, everyone. has some level of emotional intelligence. But we can strengthen these abilities through persistence, practice, and feedback from colleagues or coaches. I'm, I'm persuaded that unless you are working the steps in recovery, you do not have this feedback from colleagues and coaches in your life. We feel like that when we get grown, we got it all figured out. Brother Blake and I were talking earlier. These Bible studies didn't hurt my feelings. Because I found out I wasn't near as far along as I thought I was in the growth process. And I found out I got a whole lot more growing to do than I've done. Now, Brother Littles makes this connection in his book, More Like Him. I hope some of you have bought that book, Brother Dr. James Little. He makes this connection and determination. Spiritual formation, which is what we're in right now, we're growing. And I don't know if you realize it or not, but we got some people doing some incredible growth in this place. Amen. Individuals and in the body. Spiritual formation calls for examining our emotional holiness quotient, or EHQ. Now, specific numbers, you can't measure that by specific numbers, <coughs> but individuals, families, and churches need to consider ways they can grow in emotional holiness. I'm going to read you a few things real quick, and then I'm, I'm really going to try to get into this. Assessing our ability to bless others, to personal thanksgiving, living in hope, and joyful orientation to daily life, to live life in a joyful manner, or fellowship, calls us to put away childish behaviors and become mature disciples. Emotional holiness quotient, or EHQ, questions directly these questions directly address the degree of separation. Y'all got to hear this. Especially apostolic Pentecostals. Emotional holiness quotient. The questions that we'll ask ourselves about our emotional holiness directly address the degree of separation we have from the world's emotional dysfunction. If we find ourselves, we're talking about Holy Ghost filled believers that want to grow. If we find ourselves overwhelmed by fear, anxiety, anger, hopelessness, despair, or listlessness, y'all know what listlessness is? Lazy. Don't want to do nothing. No motivation. Then we need, then we need a season of spiritual formation directly related to emotional holiness. Did y'all hear what I just said? This is a big thing that we got to get through if we want to become what God wants us to be. You just can't put on a dress and fix everything going on in your life. Do me a favor, Lord. Start fasting and praying over the next couple of weeks that the Lord will let me move on from this. I'm just kidding. But it's 
frustrating. It's frustrating because Brother Shannon and I were talking because we were both frustrated about the same thing. And we came to the conclusion that this teaching is causing trouble. Because, Brother Chris, it challenges us on ways we really don't want to be challenged. And I've read this two or three times and I feel the Holy Ghost coming on me right now, so I'm going to tell it to you. What we're having is, Pastor, hurry up and get done with that stuff. I'm tired of listening to it. Here's what it sounds like. We came in contact with a challenge from heaven and we didn't like it. So Moses, you go up the mountain and talk to God and then you come back and tell us what he said and we're going to stay way over here because we don't want to be challenged like that. Y'all remember reading that in the Bible? They were around the mountain and thunder started coming and lightning started coming and the voice of God <laughs> Brother David scared them to death. And they said, mm -hmm. Dude, Moses, you go do that. And then come back and tell it to us. And that's how we lived for so many years. But now we're moving on up to the east side. Where we love to park it in the sky. Look here. As with all matters of holiness, we can be emotionally holy as we become more and more like Christ. We must do so as individuals as well as communities of believers. And this is so powerful. To ignore emotional holiness depletes our ability to give thanks to God and bless others. To ignore emotional holiness depletes our ability to give thanks to God and bless others. Being emotionally unholy squanders, does anybody know what squander means? Waste. Waste. Being emotionally unholy wastes emotional and spiritual resources to just make it through the day. You're getting what you need from heaven. You're hearing what you need from the word. You're getting what you need from the spirit. When you come here in the power of the Holy Ghost, just boom, 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 bubbles all over you and you shout, you dance, you run, you talk in tongues. But because you are most emotionally unholy, it takes all of that to just survive. And then there's no opportunity or room to grow. There's no room for ministry. There's no room for God to use me. And I wonder, why am I, am I having so much trouble doing something for God? Because I've never built the holiness in my emotions. A low emotional holy quotient also squanders the church's resources by asking what the church can do for us rather than living missionally on behalf of the world. When it's all about me, when it's all about me, I'm wasting what God's given me because he doesn't give us just for us. He gives us, what did the scripture say? He that believeth on me as the scripture has said, out of his, out of his, out of his belly, out of his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water. Finally, this is powerful. I wish I'd have printed it all out for you. A church without maturing emotional holiness will not serve as a contrast people in the world. The word contrast means different. It is not just enough to look different. We have to behave different. And behavior is not fueled by purpose or intent and just do the right thing. Because that's what the Bible meant when the Lord said, the Pharisees don't commit adultery. But the Lord said, I'm telling you, if you if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her. 
that doesn't mean that every nasty thought you think that you've committed adultery against your wife, but that means you are just as responsible for what goes on in the inner man as you are on the outer man. And I thought this was just really going to blow up tonight. Who emotional holiness witnesses to the blessed life of following Christ? Who would not want to join an emotionally holy people who are following Christ? Now here's what we get into last night. Brother Tony with the muscles brought the word over at Parma last night. And I'm going to tell you what. We had three Parma people last night. I can't be telling too much about everybody's business, but I'm going to tell you the Holy Ghost was in that room last night. We had three Parma people and one Risco person, and the Lord ministered to every last one of them. A major step. Here's where I'm going to start doing some teaching now. A major step in becoming emotionally holy is to see yourselves in the light of truth or as you really are. We cannot be afraid of this because we can't know where we're going if we don't know where we are. Here's what John Townsend shares. I shared this in recovery last night. John Townsend, anybody <laughs> familiar with John Townsend? He wrote the Boundaries books with Henry Clow, Dr. Henry Clow. John Townsend, they wrote the Boundaries books. I'm really trying to, you know, trying to, I kind of wish you'd have made a shout tonight, Brother Blake, is what I wish would have happened. If I'm having a hard time starting today, but I don't want to be bored. I don't want to be bored. John Townsend shares, he's a psychiatrist, psychologist, Christian psychologist, and has a practice. And he got up one morning, and he was getting ready to go to work, having breakfast with his wife. And remember, I, I told you they wrote these boundaries. Boundaries in the workplace, boundaries. It's, it's, a, it's a staple in the Christian community if you want to learn how to have healthy homes. And uh, necessary endings, Dr. Cloud, changes that heal, and how people grow. This is John Townsend and Henry Cloud. He says, as I was preparing to leave work, my wife said, you're sort of distant and preoccupied. She said, you seem unavailable to me. And she said, is anything wrong? And he said, take a guess. Everything's fine. He gets to work and he has an appointment with a client. And he starts meeting with a client. He's a psychologist in his practice. And he starts meeting with the client. And the client says, John, you don't seem to be emotionally present in this session. And John said, that's just your perception. I'm all right. Later, he went to lunch with a friend. And the friend said, John, you're here, but you're not here. And John said, I'm as here as I've ever been. And then he said to himself, I'm getting so irritated at these annoying people in my life. That evening, he came across this passage in the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 12 in the NIV. And he said, it says, We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. I'm not holding back from you, but you're holding back from me. And then he said, I have been bombarded with the same truth from several different sources. And then he had to admit to himself, I was preoccupied today. And this had led him to withdraw inside himself and disconnect from the people in his life. The people in his right now, he was disconnected from because of possibilities. He responded two ways. He said it was holy to see how many different people God used. Oh, Lord, help. It was humbling to see how many different people God had used to tell me the truth before I got the message. 
And he said at the same, same time, the second thing is I felt grateful that he had not given up on me, but he kept sending missionaries, he kept sending angels, he kept sending people to speak to me until I woke up. This is a microcosm of how we live our lives. That's something we should all crave. I believe we all do crave it, but I believe we're afraid and we don't trust people and we really don't trust God. We should crave truth in our lives. We should crave that when we look in the mirror to see things as they really are in me. Family, friends, and acquaintances who I have allowed to be in a position where God can use them to speak truth to me. The question we have to ask ourselves right now is who have I allowed into my life that can speak truth to me? Who have I allowed in my life that can speak truth to me? Why do you think? Has anybody besides me found it difficult to build relationships in the last few years? I want to. Amanda and I sit at the table. We're almost empty nesters. I kind of like it. You want to know the truth. <laughs> but we sat at the table and said, we should have somebody to hang out with. And not one time have I picked up, well, one time I picked up the phone and called somebody. One time. The rest of the time, we're content to just sit there and say, had somebody to hang out with. You know what I really want? I want God to drop them out of the sky and then come knock on my door and say, Oh, the Holy Ghost just moved me. And you're supposed to go to track me. Y'all don't want me to come hang out at the mission. I'll eat up every minute of groceries y'all got. Do you not see, think about it, think about it clearly. Do you not see we have begun to work with the enemy to divide the people of God? Why? Does anybody know why? I like people. I like visiting with people. And every time we do something with folks, I feel better because of it. But it has become easy to... I feel the Holy Ghost right now in this place. It has become easy to back off. I would argue that the reason why that we like backing off and we feel more comfortable backing off is because dealing with the truth is uncomfortable. And when you make connections and when you have people that care about you, they will care enough about you to say what in the world's wrong with you. But I don't want that. See, I don't want to have to deal with it. Because, Brother Cody, I kind of like putting my mask on. Yeah. Then can't nobody hurt me, but the same ones that I won't let hurt me can't love me either. Right. Right. We have to make ourselves vulnerable, but we don't want to. And it is emotionally unholy. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm running out of time anyway. But there is a reason why. Everything God made was good. Everything God made needed no improvement except one person. Adam. And the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. It was not sexual desire. It was not attractiveness. It was not somebody you want to shoot pool with. Come on. It was the need for companionship. Because God made man to have relationship with him. And then he realized that I made a man to have a relationship with me. But he don't have nobody to share it with. And I feel the Holy Ghost, but I feel, I feel something catty want to do. Have the whole night. I was going to tag out about half of this Bible study, and I was going to teach it, and I came here, and I started through highlighting, and the Lord said, you got to teach it like this, because we got to be real, we got to be true. But Brother Shane, we don't really want to be. We really do want to, but we're scared. 
was scared. I don't know how many people have come to me and said, I need a sponsor, I need somebody to talk to. But then when you talk to them, you do one of two things. You don't listen or you don't tell the truth. Right. A prideful act is withdrawing from everybody. The truth cannot be revealed that I am not where I'm supposed to be when I pridefully withdraw from others that are put in my life for the express purpose of helping me. And this keeps me stunned in my growth. And even if I want to grow, I cannot because I don't have the power to see myself clearly on my own. You are not objective about yourself. You will either love yourself way too much or think way too less of yourself. Now, I'm not going to teach this tonight, but I've taught it to you before. First Corinthians chapter number 13. What is that called? It's the love chapter. And at the very end of it, it says, now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. You look up that word glass, and you know what that word glass means? A mirror. It's not a window, it's a mirror. And the reason why I feel the Holy Ghost in this place right now, the reason why we're having trouble building relationships and we're having trouble trusting people is because we still see ourselves in a mirror darkly. We don't see ourselves clearly. We don't see ourselves worthy. We don't see ourselves as becoming what God wants us to be. And what the perfect love of God does is first allow you to see yourself just like you are. And when we see ourselves like we are, we can get adjusted and we can make some changes. And then we can help other people. Okay. Okay. Let's look at these verses that John Townsend read. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 11 through 13 in the NIV. It says we have spoken freely to you Corinthians and open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. Please understand, this is not an invitation into victimhood. Because victimhood leads you to confess to others because you want pity or more than anything, you want a reason to stay like you are. When we become victims, it is because we want to have an excuse to not do anything, to not put ourselves out there, to not take a risk. We can stay like we are. This is speaking to the one who truly desires to grow and be used of God. The Bible makes no allowances for victimhood. Because when I'm a victim, I have a good excuse for not growing. Now, is everybody all right tonight? Yeah. Because the air's not going or something? I turned it on. <laughs> but the problem is, Sister Nate will be under her blanket. Sister Nate will be under hers. My wife will be mad at me because she won't have the blanket. <laughs> Emotional holiness. I'm not Sigmund Freud, and I'm not Henry Cloud or John Thompson, I mean, uh, Townsend or any of those people, but I tell you what I'm teaching tonight is true. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And I'm going to teach you how to gauge your emotional holiness. I'm going to get there real quick. When we are in Christ, we are new creatures in a new family. And we have the responsibility of doing God's will. Every attribute or manner of expression that we have available to us. Primarily the way we look. And that includes more than how you dress. That includes how you appear and also the expressions on your face. The way we communicate verbally or electronically are the expression on our face. How many of y'all got that eye roll for Becky? <laughs> you can say, I love you. And you really 
have just said, I'm a liar. <laughs> See, Sister Kelly, I really don't want to deal with how I present myself. I don't want to deal with having to be aware that everything I do in living my life reflects the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I feel this spirit right now in here. Bless God, I've done enough. I gave up dancing. I gave up partying. I gave up listening to that old loud, dirty music. I gave up smoking. I gave up drinking. I gave up cussing. I gave up everything. Bless God, I'm going to be mad if I want to be mad. Come on. You had to put up with what I had to put up with, you'd be ugly too. got to be delivered from being mean. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm struggling like this is my first Bible study tonight. We got to be delivered from being mean. You can't be, you can't say everything that pops into your head. You can't share every opinion you have about somebody what color their shoes are. Come on now. Some things you want to talk about ain't none of your business. Come on. Yeah. Hmm. And then mama said, well, that's why I say by myself. But that's a problem. Because then you sit home and you think stupid things all the time. You sit home and you dream up like, I don't like this, and I don't like that. I don't like them. I don't like that. I don't know why nobody don't come see me, because I love everybody. Bless God. <laughs> Don't know what I'm telling you the truth. You see, we're not holy in our emotions. It's not something we ever even deal with. Matter of fact, and I'm all over the place right this minute. I'm in my notes, but I'm all over the place. I'm not staying in point one, two, three. But we don't even consider our emotions for the most part. Because we think however we act, we are justified in acting. <laughs> But the truth is, he when we got filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we got delivered from living on this kind of plane, and we started living on this kind of plane, and we no longer represent humanity, but we represent Jesus Christ, and we the Lord, and we He has put some mean co-workers in your life. He has put some bad husbands and wives and kids in your life so you can learn to be like Jesus. Right. We'll give an offering to Harvard to help us settle the front next time. They need to clap everything I say. <laughs> picking dream worlds half the time. Yeah. Just oblivious. <laughs> look here. The way you look. I'm talking about your appearance and your face. Yeah. Just, who are you talking? You look mad all the time. <laughs> I don't mean to be but I gotta be aware of it. Yeah. I gotta be aware of it. That's right. I gotta make my smile look stupid when it's fake. <laughs> but I gotta learn to smile. I gotta learn to be happy. I gotta learn to be glad to see people because Jesus is living in me and I'm not gonna win them mad. That's right. I'm not gonna win them sour. Let me tell you something else. You ain't going to win your kids getting around the Thanksgiving and the Christmas and the Easter table and birthday or whatever and run down the church and run down the pastor and run down everything we do. Say, well, I don't like it. Turn around. Look at it differently. People are growing. We must.
trust me. Oh, excuse me, one more thing. The way we look, the way we communicate, and our perspective, which is the way we view things. And the way you view things is determined by the lens you're looking through. Let me tell you something. God did not put people on earth to hurt your feelings. But if you're looking at everybody through the lens of who's going to hurt my feelings, everybody's going to hurt your feelings. If you look at everybody through the lens of they're better than me, or they got more money than me, or they're happier than me, if you look through the lens of everybody's up and out and down, that's exactly how your life is going to be. Oh. Emotionally holy. Hang with me for just a few minutes because I'm hot too. I'm going to take my third shower in the day when I get home. <laughs> there is no way for me to cover what it means to be emotionally holy. But I'm going to tell you right now if you're praying and you're fasting after the kingdom, you're going to have a whole lot easier time becoming emotionally holy than if you're praying and Kingdom, the word kingdom, let me share this with you real quick, comes from two words, king and domain. Kingdom is the domain of the king, and our king is the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are his subjects. And when I say pray kingdom prayers, I am praying the will of the king, not the will of the subject. Come on. Here, first thing about being emotionally holy. Oh. What is my level of thanksgiving? How thankful am I? A clear sign of the end time is folks will be unthankful. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. So the evident contrasting factor would be that the people who belong to God will be more thankful. Perhaps even more so, growing more thankful. The discipline of being thankful is so necessary today. You want to know why? Because we got so much, we don't need nothing. Yeah. And it seems that thankfulness dissipates as possessions increase and need decreases. The Bible says that the discipline of being thankful in everything is central to the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18. Paul speaks of the connection between peace and unity in the body and thankfulness, Colossians 3 and 15. Here we go. The, the reason why the struggle to be thankful is so difficult is because we are naturally inclined and society nurtures that inclination to be selfish. Selfishness retards thanksgiving because selfishness says, y'all ready for this? I deserve what I got. Or, here's the most common one, I earned what I've got. Losing sight of the truth in James 1 and 17, the Lord told us every good and perfect gift is from above and comes from our Creator. Here's how, here's the problem with not having anybody that can speak into your life. The way to break free from selfishness and to be loosed into thankfulness begins with two things. One, the revelation of truth. Yeah. And what follows the revelation of truth? Anybody know? Repentance. Stop it. Stop being that way. The second sign, I'm hurrying a little bit, the second sign or attribute of being emotionally holy is heeding the call of God to be a blessing to others. So the first thing is, is to be thankful. The second thing is to be a blessing. Remember this. I've said it before. We say it in recovery all the time. You read it anywhere. Hurting people hurt people. Brother Littles reminds us of this. This is, this is so powerful. From the neighborhood playground, 
to the highest corporate boardroom. Those who do not find healing for the wounds of their lives will live to defend themselves and to perpetuate or keep alive the shame and hurt that have been heaped on them. Well, <laughs> I'm not done. Yet. There are people in this room right now that you've been hurt at some point in your life. And every word that comes out of your mouth is either to defend yourself against somebody doing it again or to keep alive that hurt because it will become your identity. It happens at school. It happens at church. If I give people a chance, they'll hurt me. Brother Shannon, if I give anybody a chance, they'll hurt me. We have to find healing for these wounds. And I'm going to say, oh, Lord, help me. Pump the brakes on whatever else you've got going on. And go into a place of connection with somebody, prayer, fasting, whatever manner you can to find healing for them old wounds because you ain't moving forward until you deal with it. That's right. I'll take a quote to that guy when he said that when you come in, there's no sense of how you use that. And I said it. Say that one more time. The happiness you can have for a little while. Well, I think that's true. I think that's true, but I would argue with a little while. I think what we're teaching here about being holy emotionally becomes a way of life all the time because it is fueled by the way we look at things. And we, we look at things like we're a victim. If we look at things like everybody's against us, if we look at things like we're going to be a failure in everything, we ain't never going to be happy. Even when you put a quarter in the bubble gum machine and the prize you want pops out in the little plastic container. Remember that? When you looked in that window, you wanted that little thing, that little rubber bouncy ball, and you put a quarter in, and out popped a little baby doll. <laughs> When we get this right, I'm going to take that little baby doll, I'm going to go run through the aisle of rabies, and I'm going to find some little girl, and I'm going to give it to her, and I'm going to assume, God, let me have the baby so I can give the baby to you. Instead of, God didn't let me have that bouncing ball because I've been bad. Or he don't love me. Or somebody else is better than me. This makes sense? What's that? That's right. She might have a bouncing ball to give me. My lucky little pepper keep them both. <laughs> Look here. God told Moses, said, this is what the priests should do in blessing the people. This is what you say to them. Number 6, 24 and 27. Lord, bless thee and keep thee. Lord, make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Lord, lift up his countenance, his face upon thee and give thee peace. <coughs> they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. Now we're living out verse 27 because that's exactly what happens when you take on the name of Jesus in baptism. Matthew 5, 44, 45 said, I say, bless, love your enemies. Y'all ready for this? Bless them that curse you. How are we doing in that? How are we doing in that? Bless them that curse me. The Lord said, even a scoundrel is good to people that are good to them. 
takes something special to be good to people that aren't good to you. To be a blessing to people that aren't good to you. He said, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Listen, you got to do this, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Now, to bless others is indicative of being a child of God. Look at the difference in the disciples before they got the Holy Ghost and after. Before they got the Holy Ghost, they were arguing about who's the greatest here, who's the greatest in heaven, who gets the best seat, who loves God the most, who will stick with him the most. But after Pentecost, they are silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. It's the great indicator, the great declarer that you have moved into the arena of spiritual growth when you go from being a taker to being a giver. Searching for someone, searching for anyone. Have, how long since you have rolled out of bed in the morning and your prayer been, Lord, lead me to somebody that I can be a blessing to today? Anybody. It's going to have to be. It's how Jesus lived. Publicans and sinners and prostitutes and sick, lame, halt, blind, crippled, all of them were thrown to Jesus. And they all had this one thing in common. They had nothing to give him. They had nothing to give him except the opportunity to allow him to bless them. The next indicator of our emotional holiness quotient is do we live in hope? Has anybody besides me ever struggled with what hope is? The Bible says three things abide, faith, hope, and love. To me, faith and hope kind of overlap. Anybody? I kind of struggle. Well, let's, let's talk about what hope is. So the three principles given to us that are abide, faith, hope, and love. Faith is what justifies us and makes us righteous in the sight of God. We're all given the measure of faith. Every man is given the measure of faith, but it's up to us to grow our faith, right? Love is what's revealed to us when we recognize the sacrifice of the price that Jesus paid for us. When we know we're not worthy, but he came and died for us anyway and showed us the greater love. We, through the influence of that love, Fueled by faith, participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Then, propelled by love, we share that experience with others. But Brother Little shares this, and I like it. Hope, however, is unique because hope lives in the real world. Hope says that Jesus Christ will do what he said he would. Right in the face of a broken and defeated world. Hope is what allows us to behave as if what he promised has already happened. Here's what Brother Little says, and I love this. One might say that hope is faith lived out in real time. Hope is faith lived out right now. Faith says, here we go, this is a good, faith says that in the end, all suffering will be gone. Hope takes that belief and puts it to work right now. Hope lives as if the suffering is already gone. Whatever happens, we can't lose hope. The Romans 5 and 5 says, and hope maketh not a shame. Hope gives me confidence because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. The hope is the revealer of the love of God. Hope fuels our resolve to stay when circumstance says go. With faith, the content of the gospel, and complete trust in Christ, fear is defeated. But hope vanquishes despair. Hope takes us from hold on till heaven comes to let's push forward and do the work of God, even at the very gate of hell. Last thing, emotional holiness reminds us that having hope or joy in isolation is impossible. Emotional holiness requires
requires life into communion. I said earlier, Eve was created for Adam first for community and fellowship. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, about 2000, 2001. Man and I were lying in bed, all the lights on. And we've been talking since we went to bed at about 9 30 or 10 o'clock. And I felt the revelation come over me. And for the first time in my life, please forgive me if this doesn't live up to your expectations. For the first time in my life, I realized that my wife was my best friend. Amen. <laughs> Men, they weren't given to us to be sexualized. They weren't given to us to be slaves or servants. They were given to us to be our companions and for fellowship and friendship. That's the first thing. Community and fellowship were the fruit of Pentecost. Acts 2, 46 and 47. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. <clears throat> Community set the stage for the Lord to be able to add to the church. Stand with me if you would. Yes. Okay, hold on to that just for a minute because I ain't done. Okay. Yeah, give me just a minute. <clears throat> Brother Shannon's going to write this. This is the, it ain't in the, it ain't on your paper. I'll let you have it when it's done, but it's right up your alley. Community. Stay with me right now, just for a second. Community is the antidote to the disease of connecting joy to results. Because in community, we support, worship, and celebrate together. The unity is the ultimate. And hope says that if we stay together, God will bless us, which will allow us to bless others, and the organic machine of the Spirit is at work. So we rejoice together over the opportunity to serve together than rejoicing over the results of the serving. I rejoice because I have you. Not because of what I've done. Come on. Uh, ultimately, joy is the fruit of having a right relationship with God and a right relationship with each other. Neither of which can happen as long as you're wearing a mask. Because if you say everything's fine and everything ain't fine, you lie. Right. How about we let somebody start speaking into our life? Practice. We're among friends. We love each other. Practice. If you get it wrong, here's what you say. Appreciate you for caring enough to try. We're going to keep working on it and get it right. Because we need each other. Can't decide you don't need each other. Come out in the open, join the body of Christ, the community of true believers, and what the Bible calls the fellowship of the unashamed. God, I love you tonight. I thank you for your word. I'm, I know there's a struggle here, and I know this is something difficult to swallow and wrap our minds around, but Lord, you didn't call a bunch of sissies. You didn't call a bunch of weak need, half wit. You call some out Ooh. men and women of God. You call people that got some corn in their crib, that got some testimonies in their life. You call some people that have been through some junk. And Lord, you want to raise us up above the shadows. And you want to raise us up above the temporal. And you want to bring us out of this, this pull that the world has on us to be like them, look like them, talk like them, live like them. But you're pulling us to heaven. 
it's not going to be long till gravity can't hold us anymore and, and we're going to be drawn up to meet the Lord in the air with the dead in Christ. But until you come, Lord, we will occupy. We will occupy from a healthy position. We will occupy from a healthy stance, not just physically, not just spiritually, but also emotionally. This church today, Lord, there are good people in here. There are powerful people in here. There are folks in here that have never been loosed into their ministry and their calling. And I pray, God, that you will turn around their thinking, flip the script in their mind, and let us all begin to pursue holiness in an emotional place. I thank you for it in Jesus.